Good, good evening. And uh, as we uh, continue on with our song stories of the uh, Church of God, uh, looking tonight at some uh, different ones than um, I remember, uh, by title anyway, sometimes it's like one of the books, uh, the song books have the songs listed by like the first part of the verse, and I understand why now, <laughs> because sometimes in looking for a song, uh, what they record as a title might have, if it just changes just a little bit, yeah, it throws off trying to find it. So sometimes it is good to have that where it is recorded by the uh, first verse too. But uh, this evening we start uh, on one that's entitled, I am coming, Lord, to thee. It says, Upon what small pivots may the course of our lives turn, and how gracious is our Father who sends across our path at just the right moment, the prayer, the book, the sermon, or hymn, which becomes the vehicle of God's grace at the turning point of our lives. Jack S. Zeta was born in Germany of Roman Catholic parents. While he was still a youth, the family came to America. Hence it came to pass that Jack found himself a soldier in France during World War I. Being always of a serious vein, Jack oftentimes voiced the questions that troubled him. What is the meaning of life? Why doesn't religion solve the world's problems? He did indeed understand that it solved the most personal problems of all, for he witnessed to hundreds of boys dying on the battlefield and saw that the only one thing they wanted was to have someone pray for them. It seemed not to matter who did the praying, just so prayer was offered. But there were so many questions that even the church did not answer. Many times Jack talked with his Roman Catholic chaplain, asking questions and trying to discover the meanings of what he saw about him. He was especially troubled because the Christian church is so divided. Why is there so many churches? There should just be one church one God and one people. Later, Jack was transferred to Germany, where since he knew several languages, he became an interpreter for the headquarters. One day, someone handed him a gospel song. He read its message and was never the same again. A sense of joy, of elation, of having found something long sought, drove him out, out under the stars. There on the battlefield, with the light flashing from the guns, he lifted his heart to God. For the first time in his life, he was conscious of praying spontaneously. The next day, he carried the hymn to his chaplain and asked him to read it, saying, Father, if I ever meet with the, with the people who have the message and the spirit of this song, they shall be my people. The priest laughed and said, You'll always be Roman Catholic. But the young man put the song away and waited. When the war was over and Jack was home again, he began making the rounds of churches, hunting for his song. After visiting some 200 different congregations, he concluded that there was not much difference and gave much of his search and gave over his search for a time. But the hunger in his heart was too real. So again, the hunt began. A small church had been built in the community where Jack then lived, but it soon had closed its doors. One day he noticed it being, be, being repaired and that an opening day was announced. The day before it was to open, the pastor called on Jack and asked him to be present. He replied that he had sought everywhere, but had found nothing satisfying. Pastor Bailey's reply made him smile. Brother, he said, if you come here, your wonderings are over. You will never move again until you go to heaven. When Jack arrived on Sunday morning, the congregation was singing. He felt a thrill go through him. He stood and listened for a few moments before going in and thought he had never heard anything like it in all his life. The Spirit of God whispered in his heart, These are the people who have the message of your song. When a hymn book was placed in his hands, he opened immediately to the index. Sure enough, there was his song. The song that had changed his life and set him on his search for God. Now he has found what he has sought for in the love of Christ, the Savior, and the fellowship 
of God's people. So that's, that is something that a song, I mean, it is ultimately God and the experience of God in his life, but still to be so moved by that song that he didn't let go of it no matter what. And, and you know, I know just from personal experience of reading in the Bible and just wanting to know, okay, there's got to be a people that believe what the Bible says, you know, and that, you know, really you can't, how can you not teach what the Bible says? You know, even though I was in the predicament where it wasn't being taught, but God led me enough to know there had to be more. And uh, I wasn't diligent to, to search. I was younger than this one. But God brought me to the place where then I heard that, when I heard the message, and uh, that I was like, that is the truth. And uh, so it just thrills me to think of how God led the soul of this man to find uh, his people and his truth. And uh, so God is all powerful. God is all working. So the title of the song that he was looking for, which I don't know that I have heard that song, it was entitled, was I'm Coming Lord to Thee. And then this one is entitled, Come to the Savior. Among the 2,000 or more songs and hymns for which Mr. Warren wrote, either the words or music or both, some 30 or so were children's songs. D.S. Warner greatly insisted on the necessity of winning children for Christ and early began to write song poems for them. The actual responsibility for the children's work during the years the Warner Company traveled together belonged to Mother Smith and, Miss, and Mr. Warren. Many times their congregations outnumbered the adult audience, for children were treated very much like adults in the churches of those days. To hear the story and to have Barney play the mouth organ was great entertainment. One of the most popular of Mr. Warren's hymns for the young children is this, Come to the Savior, which he set to a happy singable, singable tune. So here's the words that it says, I am, I am so glad that the Savior has said, Come unto me, come unto me. When he bestowed on each little one's head blessings so rich and free. I am so glad he is ever the same, loving and kind, loving and kind. Speak unto all of his wonderful name, grace and his mercy fine. Come to the Savior, dear, dear children, today. Come, let us walk in the heavenly way. Sweet is the promise to those who obey. Come, there is room for all. So that is uh, one of the, the songs that was written for children. And I noticed that, uh, well, even in the other song stories that we were going through, a lot of the hymns were written for children, had great depth to them and great truth. But then if you think back in that time, the children were taught to read out of the Bible, right. you know. And so uh, those words and stuff were not too much of a stretch for them to read and to know and to, uh, to understand. And then as the one that we sang tonight, a child of God. Praise the Lord, my heart with his love is beaming. I am a child of God. Heaven's golden light over me is streaming. I am a child of God. Let the saints rejoice with my raptured spirit. I am a child of God. I will testify that the world may hear it. I am a child of God. Let a holy life tell the gospel story. I am a child of God. How he fills the soul with his grace and glory. I am a child of God. Save from sin today, every band is riven. I am a child of God. Through the test of life, I have peace from heaven. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. I have washed my robes in the cleansing fountain. I am a child of God. It was inevitable that the positive preaching which brought us out of this movement should be hard on conscientious people. The judgments of God do not move the hard-hearted and, ungod and ungodly sometimes. They almost always make the going very uncomfortable for the tender-hearted and the eagerly obedient, especially when they are, are yet young in the way. Out of the inner conflicts of scrupulous folks, however, God has a way of creating beauty and help, helpfulness. Precious in his sight must be the carefulness to please him that brings agony when doubt is thrown in upon the relationship of the soul to its maker. No wonder he makes us... 
makes use of these inward turmoils to bless the world. Witness the effect of Pilgrim Progress to mention only one great work conceived in the matrix of interstruggle. A child of God was born of such mental warfare. No wonder it has been an encouragement to thousands and has become one of the most used of our songs. It first appeared in the Truth in Song in 1907, and its origin is thus described by its author. In the early years of my Christian experience, I had often to struggle to resist the buffetings of Satan's accusations. Again and again, this dart was hurled at me. You are not saved. If you were, you would not feel so bad. At one time, an enemy seemed determined to overthrow my soul. Suddenly, one of God's promises came to, my, came to my help. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Isaiah 59 and 19. Some words of D.S. Warner came in with the promise. I have so much confidence in God that I would feel perfectly safe to hook my little finger over the least of his promises and swing out over the infernal regions. Immediately, my, that was words of D.S. Warner, that D.S. Warner had said that he had that much confidence that he could hook his little finger in the promises of God and swing out over the infinite uh, infernal regions. And uh, that, those words came in with the thought that God had given him from Isaiah. It says, Immediately my spirits began to lift, and I took a firm hold on another promise. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, above that you are able. But with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Every doubt fled away, and my happy soul began singing, I am a child of God. That, how that one came about. And then we have the one that we sang this evening, Beautiful, which was 182 in uh, the evening light. I'm going to turn over there quickly to read the words that was in that. Beautiful robe so white, beautiful land of light. Beautiful home so bright, where there shall come no night. Beautiful crown all wear, shining with stars over there. Yonder in mansion fair, gather us there. Beautiful thought to me, we shall forever be. Thine in eternity, when from this world we're free. Free from its toil and care, heavenly joy to share. Let me cross over there, this is my prayer. Beautiful things on high, over in yonder sky. Thus I shall leave this shore, counting my treasures over. Where we shall never die, carry me by and by, never to sorrow more, heavenly store. And then it says, beautiful robes, beautiful land, beautiful home, beautiful band, beautiful crown shining so fair, beautiful mansion bright, gather us there. It says here, perhaps the favorite song about heaven in all our books is this beautiful. It made its first appearance in the song of the evening light in 1897 and has been included without change either in word or music in each book as it came out except for Salvation Echoes until it found its rightful place in our present hymnal. It is not difficult to account for the popularity of this hymn. While its words escape the crudeness of attempting definite, definite pictures of heaven, they do suggest its very concrete terms that there are glories there. They inspire confidence and joy. The soaring melody carries the worshiper almost to the heavenly gates. This hymn is especially suitable for quartets, but it is also easily sung by a congregation. All these qualities combine to make the singing of this lyric almost as a joyful experience as the writing of it must have been. Its author thus describes the emotions which brought about its composition. One lovely spring morning in the year of 1896, I had lost myself in meditation on the beauties of nature. Beholding the works of God filled me with wonder and awe. My thoughts rose higher even to the throne of God. If the great God so loves his creatures that he has made all the earth so beautiful for their comfort and well-being, 
just for time's short duration, how utterly glorious must be the place which he has gone to prepare for his beloved. And you know, if we could just, you know, think in a minute, just somewhere that you have visited that just awed you with God's wonder of creation. Or just even really think about our bodies and what it takes to just keep us living and breathing every day. Um, and then just think, like he said, if God done that just to keep us here for a, sm a small time, what can he, what, ha what will heaven be like? Sure. The marvels of that external world are past description, of course, but I long to express in some measure what I had felt. So my sense is thrilled with the beauty of this world and my soul journeying towards the radiance of that. I went to the organ and began to play and sing. Within 30 minutes, the whole was done. Words and music as they remain to this day. 30, 30 minutes. But this that in itself is amazing too. This song has been very popular with other movements and is included in many collections. Not long after its compositions, Mr. Warren sold it, and regretting his action, he tried to buy it back, but it was refused. But for whatever reason, I think, you know, God probably allowed it to go on out and maybe bless many other places too. And then one entitled, No Shadows Without Sunshine. There is an old fable to effect that the owner of a vineyard complained that the weather did not suit his grapes. The genie of the weather appeared and asked what's, what, was, uh, what was the matter. So it's kind of like a parable here. My grapes are too sour, another answered the farmer. If I had the ordering of the weather, I would have more sunshine. Very well, replied the genie. You shall have the just, you shall have just the sort of weather you desire from now until your grapes are ripe. All you have to do is to order the sort of weather you wish each morning. The husbandman, husbandman was exceedingly happy, for now he would be sure that his grace would be the finest in the country. But at last, when harvest came, this man's grapes were more sour than before. Sorrowfully, he summoned, summoned the genie. What did I forget, he asked. Why, said the genie, you forgot the wind. There are few Christians who, wouldn't, who would not forget the gales had they the ordering of their spiritual weather, but God is wiser. He permits gigantic forces over which we have no control to tear at our vineyards and toss our vines about. The clouds shut out the sun, the rain falls, not only in gentle showers, but in sweeping torments. Happy is the Christian who believes firmly that his Lord controls the elements and refuses either to whine or to resist. <laughs> All this and more Mr. Warren has put into this song is meant to win rebellious hearts to quiet submission and to point the way to gaining the sweetness which comes only from the enduring, enduring patiently the dark clouds and the beating storm winds. One who, found the help, one who found the help the song was meant to give tells what it did for her. I wish we had the words to that one to, to read. The entitled, No Shadows Without Sunshine. So dense were the shadows in my sky that I was in despair. Brother and Sister Warren came to, me, came to see me and sang for me this encouraging song. By the time they began the second verse, my spirit was already rising. The third verse flooded me with assurance, and by the time they had finished the song, it was settled. No more complaining or repining for me. If this dense darkness was but the shadow which proves the shining of God's sun, of love and light, then my part is to trust and quietly wait until the shadow passes. From that hour, the burden on my spirit lifted, and I found it easier to believe that God is within the shadow, keeping watch above his own. Amen. So uh, God, God knows what is best for us. Even if a farmer could order the exact weather he thought, he could possibly leave out something but God leaves out nothing for our souls. And another one entire, entitled Fiery Darts. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. 1 Peter 4 and 12. 
Like Christian in the Valley of Humiliation, Mr. Warren sometimes felt the flying darts of a pollen. Out of the midst of such trial was this hymn born. One wonders if Brother Warren had Bunyan's immortal allegory in mind when he wrote, The Imaginary of the Fiery Darts. Resembles so much that the battle between Christian and his enemy that it is in temptation to quote a few lines from Bunyan's description. Christian is face to face with Apollon who stands the stride and the way determined to destroy him. Apollon, prepare thyself to die, for I swear by infernal din that thou shalt go no further. Here will I spew thy soul, and with, and with that he threw a flaming dart at his breast. But Christian had a shield in his hand, which when he caught it, and was so prevented, and so prevented the danger of that. Then did Christian draw his sword, for he saw he must bestir him. And Apollon, as fast as made at him, throwing darts as thick as hell, by which notwithstanding all that Christian could do to avoid, Apollon wounded him in his hand, his head, and foot. This made Christian give back, give a little back. Apollon therefore followed his work mightily, and Christian again took courage and resisted as manfully as he could. This sore combat lasted for above half a day, even till Christian was almost exhausted. But victory came to Christian, even as our song indicates. For when Apollon was fletch, fletching his last blow, thereby to make a full end of this good man, Christian nimbly reached down his hand for his sword and caught it, saying, Rejoice not against me, O my enemy, when I fall. I shall arise, and with that gave him a deadly thrust, which made him give back as one that had received his mortal wound. Christian, perceiving that made, perceiving that made at him again, saying, Nay, in all these things there are more than conquerors to him that love us. And with that, Apollon spread forth his dragon wings and sped away that Christian saw him no more. Christian found the same truth as the author of our song knew, that he could have the victory if he would count it so. And immediately with that knowledge came deliverance. Music for this hymn did not come to Mr. Warren, so he submitted the words to S.S. Plank, whose tune carries the words, most suitably. And so that one is entired, entitled Fiery Darts. So I don't know that I have never heard that or ever mentioned. It is in there? Okay. All right. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and read that then. So. 174. Yeah, and it is S.S. Plank that did the, okay, the music that. In the hour of sore temptation I may be, yet amid the trials Jesus' face I see. In his word my anchor holdeth to the last, while the fiery darts are flying thick and fast. In the greatest suffering man may undergo, he shall have the victory if he count it so. Conquering in the conflict soon twill all be past, though the fiery darts are fl flying thick and fast. Should I walk in trouble pressed on every side, he who knows my weakness will with me abide. I will ever trust him in the hottest blast while the fiery darts are flying thick and fast. In the heated furnace, Father, let me stay. Precious, go refining, purge the dross away. Till thy glory's image is reflected there, to the costly jewels of thy cross I wear. We shall not be wounded in the hottest fight if we raise the shield of faith in Jesus' might. Through the grace of God, we'll conquer to the last while the fiery darts are flying thick and fast. So that is the, the words. And truly, uh, reading that, then, yes, you can see the, the uh, thoughts there as to in, in the pilgrim prog progress there to Christian and the battle that was there. So now we know all the words to that one. And then another one that we sang tonight, My soul is, is satisfied. Many young people were attracted by the preaching of the early evangelist. In fact, most of the evangelistic party were young people, and many of those who gave their heart to God during the first years were young. But not all who came under the influence of preaching yielded. The world and its joys 
exerted too much attraction then as even as they do today. At one time, several young men and women felt the draw of the Holy Spirit, but resisted it while yet confessing that they were far from finding satisfaction in the course they were pursuing. They wanted life to be thrilling, they said, and evidently they were determined to make it so, and Mr. Warren recalls the occasion. One young man spent all that, he w that was left to him when his father died. He had traveled over the world in luxury, spending his time and his money in riotous living until his inheritance was spent. Upon returning home, he remarked to some of his friends, What a fool I have been to think that I could buy satisfaction with money and to try to drown the ranklings of a guilty conscience by rushing from one thrill to another. Now with money, health, and character gone, he confessed himself under a heavy load of guilt and condemnation and said, I am still dissatisfied. What a wild and useless chase I have had with the devil and with sin. Others of the group told of similar experiences. Brother Warren sat for a time in profound meditation. Then he looked up and with an expression of supreme joy on his face said, My so dissatisfied. Soon after, he submitted to me the following verse in chorus. Can a bird drink up the ocean, thirsting still from shore to shore? Or the God of all creation, leave thy heart yet craving more? My soul is satisfied, my soul is satisfied. I'm complete in Jesus' love, and my soul is satisfied. My soul was already stirring with the fullness of joy, from an inner sense of satisfaction and a touch of inspiration, I set the words to simple music to which they are still joined. The song first appeared in Echoes from Glory and has had a large vogue among the congregations in spite of the fact that many a conscientious soul has wondered whether he dare sing it in such times as inner conflicts were raging. That it expresses a great truth and, an, and a general experience of those who find God in his fullness, there can be no doubt. For certainty, it is not unreasonable to believe that God, who is the author of longing and aspirations of our soul, can fully satisfy them. And for that, say amen. Because we just think uh, tonight when we were even singing that, when we sang that part, or the God of all creation, leave thy heart yet craving more. And kind of like how we said if we could look to the most beautiful thing and think that God created that for a short duration, what would eternity be? Well, how can we think about that God of that kind of creation to make us and cover everything we need physically to maintain life and then leave us lacking when it comes to the spiritual side? No. And we can see that in the detail of the life of Jesus Christ and what it took to bring bring uh, our salvation. So no, truly, God does not leave us craving more. So truly, uh, sad to say, many times people do get drawn aside by the world. But when people can tell us they're not satisfied, we need to let them know there is one that satisfies, and that is Jesus, and uh, that God can meet their every need. And with that, we'll close this evening.